great to see a good turnout on a Thursday late afternoon. Um, as we begin this event, I'm thinking of the words of the American poet T.S. Eliot, who said, the month of April is the cruelest month. And indeed, spring is here, and nature is reawakening. And yet we have been experiencing one of the darkest times in our living memory with the pandemic, social injustice, and now war. So let us not forget that being able to gather here in person to learn and to share is indeed a privilege. Uh, I would like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences for supporting the MIC Distinguished Lecture Series. I would also like to thank the Sir Run Run Shaw grant for funding this particular lecture. This support has enabled the center to do its work on multilingualism, intercultural communication, and language and social justice. So at this point, let me invite my colleague, Professor Loredana Palazzi, the D'Amato Chair in Italian American and Italian Studies to come to the podium and introduce to us our distinguished speaker today. Thank you, Agnes, and, um, and thank you all for being here. It's a real joy. Uh, to be here, to be here in person, and to be able to welcome someone, I was going to say someone whose work I really admire, but actually it's someone whom I really admire, is a better way of saying that. Um, David's achievements are really too many to mention, but just a few. He is the author of six books, um, and, and there are more to come. Uh, the Invention of um, Monolingualism, uh, which was, um, amongst other things, a, a winner of the American Association for Applied Linguistics, Six Book Award in 2018, um, came out in 2016. Uh, recently, The Invention of Multilingualism, and I have another one here which is dear to me, Linguistic Disobedience, which he co-wrote with, um, with two colleagues. David is also, and that's how we met really, um, um, he, he was for a long time a connected to uh, a project, a large research project called, called Researching Multilingually at Borders, based at Glasgow in the UK. He is uh, the founding editor, is one of the founding editors of Critical Multilingual Studies. He's also a translator, a co-translator, a scholar of German cultures, and many, many more things. Linguistic disobedience, which I just showed you, ends with a section on encounters that changed our minds. And the invention of monolingualism and the invention of multilingualism certainly have changed my mind, including my own idea and my own thinking about translation and translation's complicity with what um, David calls trans translational monolingualism. To use David's own words in The Invention of Monolingualism, the books that he writes are not meant to tell us or to presume to tell us how to think or what to do, but to provoke discussion. And they certainly do achieve that aim. We read The Invention of Monolingualism as a group last summer as members of the Center for Multilingualism and Intercultural Studies. And after that, we had to try to get David here, literally by popular demand. That was the book that provoked probably the most discussion in, in a summer of, of reading and discussing. I know also that many colleagues are reading now, or have been reading The Invention of Multilingualism, and we're all waiting for the next one, which will come soon, and which is now called, again, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but Literature in the Age of Late Monolingualism. Got it right? Correct. All of us um, sort of are, are waiting for this book, but today he is talking to us about monolingualism in justice. You see the title up there. Before we listen to David and to what I'm sure will be a truly thought-provoking talk, let me return to linguistic disobedience and to its dedication. The book is dedicated to all those who have lived and died for languages. So as we 
Listen to David, I would like us all to remember, in the words of Rory Finnin, Professor of Ukrainian Studies at Cambridge University, that language diversity is not, should never be, language adversity. David, over to you. Thank you so much, Lordana. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. This is my first time on Long Island. Um, even though I, I grew up just a couple of miles north of here in Worcester, Massachusetts, across the uh, water, and I'm, uh, it kind of occurs to me now that there might have been some kind of conspiracy in central Massachusetts in the 1980s when I was growing up to hide the existence of Long Island from uh, school children because uh, I'm 45 years old and this is the first time I've actually made it onto Long Island. So I'm really, really happy to be here and I'm super grateful that you all came. Um, what a beautiful uh, opportunity for me. This is also the first time I've been able to cross the border into the United States for quite a while, so um, just to come and, and share this time with you uh, today. So uh, I'm really quite grateful um, to have that opportunity. And I'd like to thank particularly Loredana Polizzi, um, Agnes He, Eric Wasato, uh, Sridhar Shakaripur, and Lauren Donovan for their very, very warm welcome. And uh, Maureen Freeler, I got to spend some time with today. Uh, so this is a really a lovely um, re-entry into the United States from uh, where I work now. Um, I'm also really grateful to the Center for Multilingual and Intercultural Communication here at Stony Brook and everyone who helped me get across the border uh, today. I first wanna just share with you that I come to you from the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Humkaminam speaking Musqueam people in what is currently called British Columbia in Canada. And the uh, website nativeland.ca tells me that this right here has been indigenous territory of the Settlecott Nation. And so I'll thank them, um, past, present, and future, for having me on this land today, uh, which is a land that, of course, echoes with all those ancestors' languages, meaning-making practices, uh, translations, and conversations from time immemorial. Okay, so um, we're going to get to my funny little title, uh, Monolingualism in Justice, in just a second. But first, I'd like you to raise your hand if um, the last few months of national news coverage have exhausted you with constant talk and scrutiny about all the ways that the Honorable Ketanji Brown Jackson, Associate Justice, United States Supreme Court, uh, have, has ruled and argued over the years in matters involving multilingual evidence, multilingual jurisprudence, court interpreters, uh, the constitutional and administrative rights of bilingual limited English proficiency defendants and multilingual case law generally. You're exhausted by this coverage. I saw two hands, okay. Um, you, you know, maybe a lot of us really missed the uh, this uh, vigorous debate surrounding these things in the national news. Um, in the United States Senate, in all the hundreds of uh, friends of the court briefs, and in the White House press corps probing questions about the justice. Um, I didn't hear much about those things either. Uh, that, that, uh, that kind of escaped my attention. Um, and I don't, I don't think I really heard a thing about how Justice Jackson deals with language, translation, multilingual subjectivity, and uh, the like. Um, and the exception, I think, being a piece in the New York Times by John McWhorter over the weekend about Ketanji Brown Jackson's um, West African first name, um, which was a little strange for me to read because I don't remember such a, uh, an essay when we were confirming uh, Brett and Amy and Neil uh, to the Supreme Court. So basically, it's been crickets uh, in the Senate chamber when it came to matters that many of us in this room care about quite deeply, and, uh, and we like to you know, share with each other our concerns around language. So 
But when uh, Justice Jackson was announced by the White House on 25, uh, 25th of February, she was immediately on the hot seat for doing important professional things uh, that an ethically inclined officer of the court might be called on to do, um, like defending people imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay with or without charge, and other ling uh, limited English proficiency defendants charged or not charged with a crime. And so I thought hopefully to myself, what are all of those 100 thoughtful senators in the United States Senate uh, in Washington DC going to ask her about the irreducibly multilingual, translated, interpreted, and otherwise language mediated circumstances surrounding all of those cases on Justice Jackson's caseload at Guantanamo Bay, not to mention the multi multilingual subjectivity and evidence at hand in much of the work uh, as a public defender that she has done all along. And so I got my popcorn out and I waited for the Senate Judiciary Committee to dig into that rich multilingual case law that there must be out there um, on the public record. Uh, ready for them and their staff interns to just dig into and it was all just like one keyword search away, right? Um, but I more or less knew what to expect, which was, uh, you know, that there, there would be just maybe one or two uh, questions about language in this confirmation hearing. Uh, and the one question that we did get about language was from the senior senator from Tennessee, Marsha Blackburn, asking whether Justice Jackson could define woman for the committee. And this was actually a moment uh, when Justice Jackson could very well have seriously challenged uh, the multi uh, challenged back at the senator about the multilingual complexity of the senator's question and the monolingualism that was underpinning the way that it was posed. A uh, woman in whose language or cultural repertoire, whose lingua cultural conception of gender or sex or age or kinship or standing um, was she asking about? Um, and it turns out that the justice has an awful lot of experience, jurisprudential experience around exactly this kind of thing. And so she could have simply asked the senator, you know, Senator Blackburn, are you asking only about what, what woman means in English or are you interested in any of the other 7,000 languages that we have on this planet? Um, but her answer was uh, that she was not a biologist and uh, that turned out to be the best possible answer at the moment to uh, get the senator to back off a little bit. But um, beyond this exchange, I think we ought to be somewhat amazed about the absence of curiosity, uh, that indifference toward language, toward translation, towards interpreting and multilingualism. Um, and the presumption of monolingualism that really undergirds a lot of the hubbub and the controversialization uh, around Justice Jackson's uh, jurisprudence and confirmability to the uh, United States Supreme Court. So I wanted to start today just as a kind of exercise, but also as a celebration of Justice Jackson's arrival on the Supreme Court with a bit of a lightning tour of some of the crucial and interesting case law around multilingualism that she has ruled on and written opinions about. And I'm guessing, you know, we haven't really talked enough about this, so I'm going to take a little time to do it, if that's okay. Um, but before I do, I just want to return to the talk title for a second and um, pose to you this very basic question about justice and monolingualism, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts about it when we finish up. Do we think that monolingualism, which I define um, as the presumption or belief that one named language is adequate to house and manage all of the meanings necessary for a worldly and capacious human life? Do we think that monolingualism, maybe even mediated by interpreters, um, is perhaps the best vehicle for justice, after all, however we define justice? And I don't think it's an easy question because monolingualism oftentimes comes promising us some really interesting, exciting things uh, like clarity and consistency and transparency openness even, efficiency, uh, accessibility, accountability, and sometimes even things like precision. Um, and so I think about common sense virtues like uh, being on the same page or shared frames of reference and the like. Um, and those kind of tacitly direct us towards the idea that the best and most rigorous interpretive communities, the best communities of practice 
uh, are those that are monolingual or operate in these way and uh, these ways and promise us these virtues of clarity and transparency, etc. But many of us in this room, I think, probably have a hunch or some experience that tells us that maybe monolingualism isn't all it's cracked up to be when it comes to ensuring and uh, pursuing justice. Justice for different kinds of people, for the living and the deceased, uh, for communities here in Stony Brook and elsewhere, uh, for non-human entities, and for truth itself. So uh, if we have that hunch, what exactly does multilingualism why does multilingualism look like a better path for these purposes? Is it just because parties to justice tend sometimes to be multilinguals themselves, or that parties tend to speak different languages? Or is there maybe more to the story? And uh, I do hope that I can hear a little bit from you as well um, in the course of today. Uh, but for now, we're going to turn back to uh, Associate Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson. I love saying that, Associate Justice. Um, her record of rulings, arguments, and opinions, and also how her jurisprudence ex espouses either multilingualism or monolingualism in different cases. So um, here is Justice Jackson at work with the highlighters and all sorts of stuff. You didn't know that Supreme Court justices had highlighters. Um, there is Azadeh versus the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is a case um, involving evidentiary and administrative documents translated back and forth between English and Persian, um, which Ms. Afsane Azadeh needed in order to sue Iran for uh, inhumane treatment she suffered during three months of imprisonment there. Um, there is Abda Abd Abdel Basset Youssef versus the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates from 2021, a wrongful termination employment case that hinged on ambiguities in the English translation of Youssef's job uh, title and job description from Arabic. And that first became an issue when Ms. Youssef uh, was summarily fired uh, after 18 years of working at the Emirati uh, Embassy in Washington. There is Capital Keys LLC versus Democratic Congo 2017, which involved a DC lobbying firm aggrieving an unpaid bill from Congo's central bank. And this was a case that required an authoritative translation from French of the central bank's governing legislation. There is Nasif versus Republic of Iraq 2020, which involves a dispute between a Jordanian company and the Republic of Iraq about a debt payment involving a shipment of sulfur and urea. Uh, there is Adamski versus McHugh, 2015, which has some Latin in it for some reason. I'm not sure quite why. And uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson ruled and wrote opinions on all of this stuff. So cases in which language dearly mattered. And often she wrote about why language dearly mattered. And so I like her more and more the more I read about all of this. And I think, you know, even just this body of jurisprudential uh, record shows that her experience around multilingualism uh, makes Senator Blackburn's question uh, seem rather one-dimensional and uh, somewhat, yeah, yeah, just scratching the surface of the question. Um, and this is even though she is working in a justice system that offers little to no principled guidance or attention when it comes to such linguistic matters. So in some ways, she's making it up as she goes. In the end, there's nothing particularly spectacular about uh, or revolutionary about Jackson's uh, rulings, but I'd like to look a little bit closer at some of them. Um, so here is in Ray air crash over the South Indian Ocean on March 8, uh, 2014, which of course had to do with the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. Uh, then Judge, now Justice Jackson, determined that the, in that case that and I quote from her, it is no more convenient to have evidence translated into English and brought to the United States than it is to have the evidence translated to Malay and brought to Malaysian courts to be considered along with other evidence pertaining to both damages and liability. 
So this appears, uh, this case appears to be a mere jurisdic jurisdiction juris uh, disposition matter. But what is so interesting to me is Jackson's intuitive trust in the M Malay language and its users and justices to do just as adequate a job at adjudicating this case as a gen generic Anglophone judge uh, would do in the United States. It seems like somewhat of a tiny matter um, but it reflects very interesting uh, methodological convictions, I think, around the potential equity um, of languages to prudently do justice such that English doesn't have some kind of presumed supreme or supremacist rank and rigor. Uh, this is Pierce versus uh, DC, District of Columbia, which is a case about the provision or non-provision of adequate sign language interpreting for incarcerated persons pursuing justice and adequate health care while incarcerated. So Jackson writes, the parties disagree about when and whether Pierce actually asked prison officials, healthcare providers, and class instructors to accommodate his hearing disability by providing an interpreter to translate for him. So Justice Jackson here has a keen interest, we'll see, in scrutinizing the evidence around exactly when William Pierce received adequate ASL interpreting. So she wants the details, and she is not willing to take prison officials' word for it about what happened. And so I like her more and more. Um, check out this level of detail that she uh, gives to this complex situation. You know, imagine you're an incarcerated person needing ASL uh, uh, interpreting. The district admits that Dr. Doe showed Pierce the medical intake questions on the computer screen rather than getting an interpreter to translate Dr. Doe's spoken questions. But the district argues that the fact that Pierce answered the questions through gestures and writing shows that Pierce must have understood the questions that he read off the screen. So it sounds to me like Justice Jackson isn't just a brilliant legal mind, but also a practical human being who doesn't like to get hoodwinked by simplistic monolingual hearsay or deceptively commonsensical paraphrasing. Um, and so this is a scene right here that goes to what forensic linguists call event complexity. So the conviction that multiple languages will themselves likely help us to witness and better understand the truth of a matter, and not just to hear the parties themselves. So that languages will help us understand what is actually going on in the situation at hand. And so we'll come back to this concept of event complexity in a little bit. Um, and finally, we'll come to the uh, good folks fighting uh, the fight at Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center in El Paso, Texas, versus Chad Wolf. And Chad Wolf, you might know as Donald Trump's acting Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, before his appointment as such was ruled unlawful. Um, so Las Americas sued Chad to stop a policy that um, forced asylum seekers to undergo the credible fear process while detained in U.S. Customs and Border Protection custody. So credible fear, of course, is the key criterion um, that one must establish under the 1951 uh, Convention on Refugees. Uh, to advance a successful asylum petition, one must demonstrate that they have a credible fear of, of danger um, in the place or the country that they left. Uh, so the, the threshold isn't de uh, evidence of that danger so much as evidence of the credible fear. And so an unnamed uh, petitioner, plaintiff in this uh, case, describes the kind of practical procedures that characterized her own experience of the credible fear uh, intake process in uh, Customs and Border Patrol custody. And um, again, God bless her, Justice Jackson is interested in the specifics, so the parts of the communicative situation that might escape attention if justice took an abstracted and narrow view on language, on language use, on language in context, on communication and embodiment and space and human relations in general. So in her ruling, Justice Jackson was interested in how the plaintiff, and I quote from her uh, opinion, describes the interview as very confusing 
confusing because she thought, that's the plaintiff, that she would have the opportunity to present the case in person. She had trouble understanding the interpreter's Spanish and her baby would not stop crying, which made it very difficult to concentrate. So you'll notice so far that I've been focusing not on what um, and how Justice Jackson actually decided, but rather what aspects and dimensions of communicative evidence and language um, and language-informed reasoning attracts the justice's attention. Um, so for me, that's more important than the actual decisions, is what parts of language did, uh, did she actually, or does she actually tend to pay attention to? And what of that type of attention uh, and language-informed reasoning is she bringing to the United States Supreme Court? And this is one of those areas where I, I strongly differ from people that say her conf confirmation does not alter the ideological uh, balance of the court. It certainly does if we have a justice who is bringing in concerns of language and translation into the picture uh, that have been uh, neglected uh, for um, centuries, I think. Um, but for now, we're going to wish uh, Justice Jackson good luck and uh, turn, unfortunately, to this fellow. Um, right here, uh, who has a very different approach to language and multilingualism. So in 2017, which seems like ages ago, when I was young, um, Louisiana Associate, uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, S Scott J. Crichton, uh, wrote that a certain plaintiff uh, named Warren, Warren DeMesum who was suspected of a violent crime, had not in fact invoked his Sixth Amendment constitutional right to an attorney at the time of his arrest because the suspect, who was 22 years old at the time, had tried to get a lawyer in the initial police interview by saying, why don't you just give me a lawyer dog? So according to the Louisiana Supreme Court Desmesum's request formulated in this particular way, why don't you just give me a lawyer dog, um, was not adequate for accessing rights under the United States Constitution's Sixth Amendment because Mr. Desmesum had not formulated his rights in proper language. Um, so Justice Crichton explained his refusal to overturn the lower court's evidentiary rulings on the following grounds. The defendant's ambiguous and equivocal reference to a lawyer dog does not constitute an invocation of counsel that warrants termination of the interview. Wow. Um, so let's just acknowledge for a moment that Justice Crichton and Justice Jackson do both seem to have in common an interest in language and communication. Um, as relevant features of evidentiary discovery and due process. So they both share about that much in common. Um, but their disposition toward linguistic evidence diverges um, sharply along the lines of prescriptivist raciolinguistic ideology, monolingualism, and linguistic white supremacy. And uh, so this case involving Warren Desmesum doesn't quite appear to be about multilingualism in any conventional sense, but is absolutely about linguistic exclusion from access to justice, from the right to have rights. And it is prototypical, I think, in our time when I believe that monolingualism is actually fortifying itself rather than abdicating and weakening its grip on power. So Mr. Desmesum's experience ought to suggest to us a trend increasingly prevalent in multilingual societies like the United States and the United Kingdom, a trend I describe as catacontic justice. So from ancient Greek, uh, the catacon is that force which is designed to withhold or restrain. So it's seen in the book of Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 and Romans chapter 13. Uh, for you uh, Bible knowers. Um, and in the book of Thessalonians, the catacomb is that which holds back the Antichrist and its lawlessness, that which guards against chaos. So um, in this situation, a catacontic monolingual justice um, in matters of language would be that which is designed to withhold rights from petitioners based on uh, either technicalities, or in this case, on a pretense to incomprehension, 
or on monolingualism's inherent tendency to uh, fetishize assertion, and that's a, a, a term that I'll come back to in a little bit. So Warren Dismesum has been adjudicated by the Louisiana Supreme Court not just as having been criminal, um, but as having been incomprehensible before the state in his communication with those officers of the state who are obliged to uphold constitutional provisions like this. And so he and they both, as parties to this matter, are both absolved from any constitutional protections and due process based on language. So taxed uh, for having used elements from an historically African-American English repertoire, Desmesum comes up against a postmodern, post-multilingual form of uh, punitive catacontic justice, one that is well aware, uh, thank you very much, of linguistic variation and multilingual repertoires, but sees the multilingual world not as calling out urgently to us for new procedures for jurisprudential understanding, but um, uh, or capacity for event complexity or greater precision in the pursuit of truth. That's some of the things that multilingualism could be asking for, from the justice system, but rather it responds with providing a, a, a loophole for disqualification and disinclusion from the presumed community of justice-seeking and justice-deserving subjects. And so Justice Crichton boldly goes, goes forth with his pretense of incomprehension on behalf of the officers who arrested and questioned Warren Desmesum. And I feel like the prototypical tragedy here is that more often than not in the United States and in the UK, um, multilingual evidence is excluded by practice or principle despite the extraordinary relevance and usefulness of that evidence for the pursuit of truth. Um, and this is more and more the case, I think, as the social and commercial phenomenon of multilingualism becomes every more, ever more practically unavoidable for institutions of justice. And I understand these tensions and these battles to be central to what I've been describing uh, since about 2009 as a use linguarum system, so a justice of languages. And so a use linguarum, like a use soli or a use sanguinis, is an exclusionary principle of justice, not an ecumenical one. Uh, so whereas the latter two systems, use solely as uh, uh, justice um, uh, imputed to persons based on where they are born, or use sanguinis as justice imputed to people based on their blood or ethnicity, um, uh, and those are two systems that withhold rights based on those, uh, those qualities in a person. Uh, a use linguarum system is exclusive in that it is very aware of the impact and relevance of multiple languages in a particular matter and in a, a particular context, and then chooses to narrow its focus and recognize only certain languages selectively, so to restrict the aperture on linguistic evidence so as to suit political administrative, statutory, or evidentiary priorities that are often entirely indifferent to language otherwise. So cases like the one against Warren Desmesum, which are braced and fortified around such a use linguarum, engage in a form of what I think of as, uh, and this is drawing on uh, the ethicist Bernard Williams' work, fetishizing assertion and doing so in a particularly monolingual way. So in his book, uh, Truth and Truthfulness, right here, I love that title, um, uh, Bernard Williams writes that if lying, and now I'm quoting uh, Bernard Williams, if lying is inherently an abuse of assertion, then so is deliberately exploiting the ways in which one's hearer can be expected to understand one's choice of assertion. The doctrine of, te of teleology of assertion makes the assertion into a fetish by lifting it out of the context in which it plays its part and projecting onto it, in isolation, all the force of the demand of truthfulness. So this is what Justice Crichton did with Warren Desmesum's language, lifting it out of the context in which it plays its part socially um, and fetishizing it as an abstract assertion 
And uh, the telos of his doing so, so the purpose of his doing so, was to be able to claim that the utterance, why don't you just give me a lawyer dog, was incomprehensible to the officers in question and the states they represent, and therefore ungrievable or, or uh, unactionable. So here I think we see the ways in which monolingualism today, uh, oftentimes I call this organized monolingualism, um, is seeking to narrow, narrow the gauge for comprehensibility around us and in us. So withholding comprehensibility in justice against the supposed antichrist of linguistic chaos, and in this case, particularly against linguistic blackness. Um, Usually, uh, around the topic of multilingualism in the United States and the UK, uh, justice systems, the inquiry focuses uh, around the adequate or inadequate provision of interpreters. But this problem of underfunding and adequacy is minor when compared to the catacontic monolingual assembly line justice carried out most days on almost exclusively multilingual persons in, on the uh, US-Mexico borderlands in the cities of Yuma and Tucson in Arizona, Las Cruces, New Mexico, El Paso, Laredo, Brownsville, and McAllen, Texas. So there, as part of a zero tolerance immigration policy that corresponds to no actual surge in immigration, attorneys estimate that 99% of defendants, oftentimes 80 per day per court, plead guilty to petty misdemeanor immigration infractions with a single Spanish word, culpable. So then they are immediately deported, and the sheer number of daily prosecutions requires all judges to combine the initial appearance, arraignment, plea, and sentencing into one hearing, um, and many streamlined def uh, defendants complete the entire proceeding, so meeting with counsel, making an initial appearance, pleading guilty, and being sentenced after waiving pre-sentence reports um, within a single day. And uh, they are uh, shackled in leg irons, and the defendants listen to a Spanish-language interpreter speak to them um, through earphones, and the possibility of responding is radically attenuated. And so this is one of the reasons why I can't wait to hear what Justice Jackson, Associate uh, Justice of the United States Supreme Court, is going to have to say about some of these situations. Um, Operation Streamline has been uh, running for at least, I think, 14 years now. And it epitomizes a catacontic state um, that has decided it will not listen to people whose language is other than, than English and has removed all pretense of doing so. But in some ways, travesties like uh, Operation Streamline were always baked into the cake in a society where since the 1950s, the broader relationship between multilingualism and jurisprudence um, has been broached in uneven and fascinatingly, uh, fascinatingly un inadequate ways. So legal administrative procedures around linguistic diversity in courts are built in a helter-skelter, an ad hoc way and these invisibilized ad hoc procedures have tended to negatively impact Latinx, Afro-Latinx, uh, African and Asian American defendants and petitioners in ways that are both foreseeable and unforeseeable, uh, particularly when it comes to their ability to appeal on the grounds of mistranslation or inadequate access to interpreting. So as Lisa Santaniello shows, appellate courts overwhelmingly treat interpreter errors as evidentiary issues, not as administrative errors, and they accord sig significant deference to the trial judge, thereby abdicating their responsibility to secure the rights of limited English proficiency uh, defendants. And this means that even when there is evidence of a mistranslation or of a meaningful difference between the language of testimony and the language of court, the monolingual administrative norms of courts ensure that there are few actionable grounds for appeal under federal or state law. And the reason generally given for this by appellate courts is that a defendant's attorney ought to object to a mistranslation at the time, which, of course, uh, presumes either that the attorney or the defendant is ready and able to do so. 
So as Santaniello uh, points out, the enduring paradox of this design is that relying on criminal defendants to object to mistranslations only protects the constitutional rights of, uh, of defendants who are proficient enough in English to recognize mistranslation. And this is at odds with the purpose of providing uh, uh, court translation in the first place. And of course, constitutional protection should not depend on English proficiency at all. So the overall picture that Santaniello shows is one about how absolutely impassive US legal systems continue to be about the implications of multilingualism on the people, truths, and event complexity to which their proceedings are allegedly devoted. And Santaniello's analysis of case law in multiple jurisdictions can help us grasp monolingualism's profound curtailment of intersectional justice and its ongoing contribution, of course, to impoverishment and over-incarceration. Uh, asylum interviews, too, are notoriously grueling scenes and scenarios involving predominantly multilingual applicants, and states often use catacontic administrative means to withhold international uh, law um, and recognition from claimants based on what amounts to their, uh, the exploitation of their multilingualism. And these catacontic means in asylum law were certainly what drove Las Americas versus Wolf, the case in which uh, Justice Jackson ruled. Um, Diana Ede's work in uh, the Australian context kind of uh, shed some light on how Australian court proceedings tend to monolingualize evidentiary testimony by permitting court transcripts only to reproduce English utterances and not bilingual or indigenous language, language contributions. While the court could indeed just as well gather information based on collaboration between interpreters and witnesses who could self-translate uh, relevant aspects of multilingual testimony and enter all of that into the court record. But the uh, court presumptive or pre preemptively reduces the admissibility criterion to English alone and this negatively impacts not just people, but also the court's access to truth in a complex, practical world. Uh, Luna Filipovic, another cognitive linguist, reflects on how Spanish and English tend to foreground different poles on the typological cline as regards the representation of motion. So it turns out in court testimony that the relation between two languages, between Spanish and English, for example, could help listeners and decision makers best approximate a, a situated truth in a, of a complex event. So Filipovic um, explores the evidentiary implications of active formulations in Spanish, like rompí un vaso, versus reflexive pseudo-passive formulations with and without dative uh, markers of interest. So something like se me rompió un vaso or se rompió un vaso. So there's different ways of doing this. And she shows that, um, of course, that's three different ways of saying I broke a glass or a glass broke at me or a glass broke because of me or something like this. So she shows that uh, Spanish speaking participants who she interviewed specified causality as intentional or unintentional far more frequently than did English speakers. And she also found that Spanish uh, users um, and Spanish patterns of use uh, in witness testimony tended to favor directional verbs without much reference to the manner of the motion, while English usage offers many more manner-oriented verbs than, uh, and so a combination of these two languages could help um, you know, decision makers, uh, juries, who knows, uh, pin down the essential features of spontaneous habitual language that might matter in obtaining uh, information from a witness or about a scene. So this means that court proceedings ought to consider introducing into evidence both the original and translated ver versions of a testimony. And when they do not, they may be violating a kind of due process that has not quite been identified or invented in civil and international law yet. But, you know, I think we will pretty soon. 
So uh, I, I think Filipovic invokes this really potent metaphor of language as a witness to show that languages themselves can be understood under contemporary political circumstances as functioning as subjects of witness, as witnesses in important settings of legal and, and evidentiary interpretation. So marshalling the truth-telling power of individual languages can help advocates come to the defense of people who find themselves in peril. And the good news is, we have some good news, I promise. Um, oh, I should have advanced this earlier, sorry. Uh, European law these days um, is extraordinarily interested in such linguistic event complexity and is therefore a kind of vanguard, I think, of a particular kind of multilingual practice. So European multilingual jurisprudential practices go even beyond uh, some of the things that Filipovic was talking about. <clears throat> um, so it's it's practices and its proceedings are multilingual, not only so as to accurately understand what a given person, so a witness or a plaintiff or an official has actually said before the court, which is also a, an important thing, but also to figure out what is actually, what actually happened in the world, or what does the law mean that they're actually trying to interpret? So European laws have 24 uh, versions, and you can consult all 24 to figure out what a certain law means. So uh, the lawyer and linguist Lawrence Solon makes the very heartening observation that legal multilingualism in Europe is not just an unintended consequence of a legal system that is otherwise functioning smoothly in a multilingual jurisdiction. Rather, it is an important element of that system's design. So Solon uh, developed the notion of Augustinian interpretation to describe the actual interpretive practices of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And he claims that multilingual language versions of laws and statutes help to reduce the opportunity for parties to take advantage of linguistic accidents. Um, A-C-C-I-D-E-N-C-E, -E, resulting from fetishizing assertion. So what the Court of Justice of the European Union regularly practices in its deliberations is a multilingual version of this principle. So no single formulation of a legislative assertion in any of its 24 languages, I think English is still part, of, is it still 24 or 23? I'm not sure. Um, but in any of those versions of a law or a statute is expected to bear the, uh, none of them is expected to bear the entire weight of truthfulness. Um, it is expected to call on the corroborating assistance of the other languages. And this Augustinian approach to multilingualism, where people dialogue through different languages on shared questions about a particular truth, emboldens, I think, what uh, the feminist philosopher Sandra Harding has called strong objectivity. Um, so as Sandra Harding pointed out in the 90s, the kinds of explanation favored by modern sciences have not always been the most effective ones for all projects. Very understated. Um, the neutrality ideal functions more through what its normalizing procedures and concepts implicitly prioritize than through explicit directives. So Harding wasn't, um, wasn't explicitly concerned with multilingualism, but we could very well replace her word neutrality in her synthesis um, about the weakness of scientific reasoning with the word monolingualism. Um, Last slide. Uh, contrasting European uh, multilingual Augustinian interpretation at the Court of Justice of the European Union, Lawrence Salon points out how monolingualism in the United States constrains jurisprudential precision, even in cases not involving multilingualism per se. So there was a case in 1987 called California versus Brown. It was a death penalty case where the jury in the penalty phase of the trial had been instructed by their judge that they may not uh, be swayed in their sentencing by, quote, mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. And so Albert Brown's uh, death sentence was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. So this is the Rehnquist Court. You might not recognize some of those faces um, in 1987. 
Um, but the problem for that court was that without any alternate multilingual versions of the judge's initial instructions at hand, as there would have been in a European uh, setting like the Court of Justice of the European Union, the US Supreme Court was unable to determine whether the adjective mere at the beginning of the sanctioned features above applied to all of these terms or just to the first one, sentiment. And so, yeah, the legal world is amazing. So, um, and with this, this one monolingual Eng English formulation of the judge's instruction, um, which is, again, functioning here uh, monolingually as what Bernard, uh, Bernard Williams called a fetishized assertion, the Supreme Court decided it could not overturn the pe penalty. It had nowhere else to look for guidance on this. And the respondent, Albert Brown, therefore was put to death as a consequence. So this is the kind of example where justice could have been more precise by appealing to multilingual interpretation, but wasn't. And I think in an age of a use linguarum, we find ourselves with factually multilingual societies where states are using that f factual multilingualism as an administrative means for exclusion of rendering people uncredible, um, whether in civil, criminal, or asylum cases, and reducing the potential usefulness of that multilingualism in matters of evidence, review, and legal interpretation. Um, but how we view multilingualism in the future politically has to involve uh, engaging the actual complex prospect of just state involvement with languages and language diversity so that it's not just the creativity and liveliness of multilingual practice and multilingual identity that we must champion, but also its credibility and truthfulness. So, um, the problem is practical multilingualism cr usually disturbs a vision of a shared public sphere which since John Stuart Mill in 1851 has been assumed to require the use of a shared language. And I think we are just now um, at the beginning of an exciting era where that kind of practical multilingualism can be regarded in and beyond matters of justice as assisting in the pursuit of truth rather than deterring it. And it sounds to me like as of this week, we might just have a new Supreme Court justice who believes in this too. And thanks a lot for sticking around. So that's it. Thank you very much, David. This is a, um, a lot of food for thought, right? So um, we have some time for questions and answers. Thank you, that was very interesting. I didn't know about the European Court of Justice, even though I'm European. I mean, I knew it existed, but not the details of how the language works. Do you have examples where uh, translations into other languages of the same law uh, resulted in the justices interpreting it in a way that wouldn't have happened if they had looked at one? And, and isn't there also always a sense that a translation can actually be wrong because the law was probably not written in Maltese. And if someone then goes to the Maltese and makes an argument based on the Maltese translation, there's a good chance that that translator just got it wrong and the intention was subverted. So how does that work in practice to use 24 versions of the law? I know, isn't it great? <laughs> so thank you so much um, I was so excited to discover this set of facts it sounds a little bit you know there's there's aspects of the European Union the European Council of Europe that disappoint me this is not one of them so um, it's it's very exciting um, and to your first question yes there are tons of laws that get reviewed in very um, I mean let's see how many people are there that's a lot of people that's a lot of just, justices, and they all speak 24, or they, they work in 24 different languages. Not all of them, but you know, they have different you know, access to, and they also have, of course, clerks that work for all of them. And so you have 
so, you know, a matter of a parking ticket or a matter of a, um, a uh, veterinarian's treatment or a matter of a tax law, which is, of course, Italian is spoken both in Switzerland and in Italy. And so sometimes there's differences between the way a certain word gets used um, in Swiss Italian versus Italian. Italian and so the justices have to figure out you know what is actually going on there in the law and um, I, I remember one case of a disputed parking ticket that went all the way to the Court of Justice of the European Union where the key was um, consulting the Danish version of the law and it had nothing to do with the the language of the the plaintiff you know um, this might seem a little bit like uh, overkill you know a, this Augustinian translation or Augustinian interpretation business. But I think what is so exciting about it is that it kind of turns the, the formula on its head and says, actually, a multilingualism and a team of people working in 24 languages has a better shot at avoiding linguistic accidents. So as it, uh, avoiding a... Um, a situation in which the way something is phrased is going to cause an injustice and that checking it against other languages is actually probably a good idea. So, I mean, I would, if I could quit my job and just clerk for one of these people for a while, it'd be super <laughs> fun. I mean, looking at 24 different versions of a law, how amazing. And there are these um, uh, teams of, of people whose job it is to do this, and I think that uh, we deserve no less, you know, we deserve no less in a world like ours. Um, I've forgotten your second question. I'll try to keep it briefer. Yeah, yeah, lots of, and, and of course there's other aspects of European statutory language that everybody's trying to keep exactly the same so, so as to reduce uh, linguistic accidents. And that makes sense for things that are not about justice. You know, for example, how are light bulbs supposed to work? You know, if, you, if you've got infrastructural aspects around how some technology is supposed to work, then it's probably important for it to be technically quite exact. But when it comes to justice, I think there's a broader principle at hand. Um, yeah. Thanks. Hi. I don't think I need a microphone. Thank you. Uh, so for everyone else here, yeah, I think I'm pretty loud, right? That's fine. That's fine. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, this is really, really exciting, and uh, it's really interesting to me. Um, I know that you're talking a lot about um, this language in uh, form uh, reasoning, right? Um, uh, which we um, you use um, Judge um, Jackson as an as an example. So you start and end with um, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and um, I'm usually a very optimistic person, but I'm going to um, somehow talk about it in a, in, in a pessimistic way. Um, yeah. Because when we're talking about um, now the Supreme Court hearing, right, uh, the justice hearing uh, as a spectacle, uh, we all get to see it now, yeah. um, but it's all done through English, right? Um, so the majority of um, the Americans um, uh, who understand ang English can um, can watch it and learn about uh, the justice system and how this whole thing is being played out uh, to select a justice, right? Um, but there are also a, a, a handful of Americans who doesn't have access to English language to really understand and to um, to act like me, religiously watching, right? Mm, um, yeah. The the the, um, the, the hearings. Um, so we still have a system that does not address. Uh, the kind of um, linguistic justice that we're hoping for, uh, because these are people who cannot, uh, that we have people in this country who does not fully understand um, this spectacle uh, to know about the system. Um, what do you think about that? Um, yes. Uh, thank you. And I just before, you know, I, I know people have other things to do. Thank you so much for being here. Don't, uh, I, I, I will, I will not be too sad if you miss the next couple of questions, but um, thanks particularly to students who came out uh, this afternoon. Um, yes, I mean, one of the ways that your question struck me early on in this, in this research was thinking about Ottoman law and how difficult it was for a, a normal, everyday Turkish person to understand anything that was going on in the imperial court 
absolutely anything, what the tax person said. You know, there's actually a wonderful cartoon, uh, what, what, what is it, Hajivat and something? Where, where it's a, 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 a cartoon about the, you know, local person and the tax man comes from, from uh, the imperial seat and talks a completely different language. And so I don't think that's a... I don't think that's an ideal situation either. And you know, the, uh, generations, centuries of people worked in England and France and in uh, the Ottoman world to make sure that people who were subject to laws were able to understand those laws. And I will, I mean, I, I will never disrespect that effort to make sure that that listener or, or subjects of law understand laws. But it was, it did go in the direction of what we now call monolingualism. And so I, I think that it's a, an important thing that I cannot take for granted that I can usually sit down and read a law and understand some of its implications for me. Do I do so? Not usually, you know. <laughs> but the, the uh, ability to do so, I, I do not ever want to take for granted and just being a person who you know has filled out immigration paperwork for example in Germany and knowing how to read Amtsdeutsch you know legal German is um, you know it's a very scary thing you feel like you're gonna miss something you feel like you're gonna f check the wrong box and so all of these uh, kind of catacontic features uh, that are criminalizing people in certain states in the United States for registering to vote. Like, what if you checked the wrong box? What if you didn't know that having a misdemeanor uh, on your record meant that you were not eligible or something like this? So there's lots of ways that I think these systems are now trying to catch people not being adequately monolingual. And, um, and that is a deeply cynical thing. Uh, I, I wanted to end on an optimistic note uh, after a not particularly optimistic talk, but uh, I do share your um, your feeling of, of deep, deep concern about that. David, thank you again. You 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 mentioned you sanguinis and you solly and and your um, notion of use linguarum. So, for instance, in the Italian context where the the law remains strictly use sanguinis, mm -hmm. um, but there is a debate about its potential change. What is being proposed, and I would like to hear your thoughts about that, is not the catacontic use linguarum, but, and it is being proposed from a, a, an allegedly at least, you know, progressive side and, and, and left-leaning side, is the idea of a use culture. <laughs> Said here for the first time, huh? Is it is it actually called a use culture? It is named as use culture, oh. and it is being debated as the alternative to uh, an idea of citizenship based either on location of birth, so use soli, or the bloodline. Therefore, the use um, the use sanguinis. In the Italian context, of course, the traditionally the use sanguinis is the dominant one because of the the large Italian diaspora and the the, the, the way in which it has yeah. remained possible and politically it has been part of discourse that emigrants can claim um, sort of the bloodline back to two, three generations, basically. But now the alternative that is being proposed is the idea of use culture, and that's exactly what is being used. Of course, there's also the other thing that in the Italian context, again, what you were describing as the inintelligibility of legal language is known as Latinorum. And all of this is Latin, of course. You sanguinis, you slinguets. Mm -hmm. Well, I did not know about uh, culture. Um I'm going to be Googling that all night, I think. Uh, but, but I Thank you. I, I, I do, you know, Germany did not do particularly well with this kind of thing in, in 2001 when it came up with the idea of a Deutsche Leitkultur, so a German leading culture. Um, it turned out, so this, it was uh, fascinating. So in the 1990s when Germany was was realizing that its use sanguinous policy, its policy of recognizing citizenship only for people with German blood, whatever that means, um, 
w that had been enforced from 1914 to 1999, that if they dismantle the use, uh, use uh, sanguinis, they had to replace it with something else. And so right around that time also in Germany, there was this idea of a German leading culture, and it was things like constitutional patriotism, uh, gender equity, and all sorts of things, which sound great on paper, but it, when it came to uh, the way they were practiced or uh, they were the way they were um, assessed in a, in multicultural context was deeply problematic, and so you also started to get the the phenomenon of immigration tests that would be high stakes versions of figuring out who is suitable for for uh, a you know an, a visa or for an extension of their visa based on whether they answered um, uh, multiple choice questions about culture, right? Um, I've, I know there's, there's a couple of wonderful books about the U.S. immigration um, tests that uh, show very, very similar phenomena that, um, that it's actually quite difficult to determine what would be an acceptable uh, kind of shared cultural repertoire to ask for. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to be spending some significant time thinking about this now. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting because I've been thinking a lot about the monolingualism and multilingualism. Uh, based on what you, uh, what you said, uh, also you mentioned about the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's kind of interesting because we kind of compare the pre-modern societies and the modern societies. Obviously, this ideology, one country, one language, started with the building of modern states. So, Exercising monolingualism policy is not very rare in the United States, but it's a reflection of the changing society to me. So I kind of wonder, you know, how you view uh, uh, the future direction from here. Oh. Uh, it's one political entity, the United States, will have uh, some changes in its policy, especially toward the language, but let's say, Multilingualism is quite different. To me, it is impossible goal. It is almost a myth. <laughs> uh, so uh, I just want to hear how you think about the future of the uh, multilingualism in this society. Right. Um, thank you. I, so the future, we're all going to have the future together. That's number one. Um, I, I think that the next couple of decades are going to be an absolutely wild ride for this kind of thing. I, the rest of my career, I will be re retiring in 2042. So between now and <laughs> June 30th, 2042, I will be dealing with these questions nonstop, I think. And, um, you know, basically for the last, since the monolingualism book came out, I've been increasingly convinced that monolingualism is actually strengthening and fortifying rather than decreasing um, and that the technologies around monolingualism, administrative technologies, uh, industrial technologies, um, uh, are, are, are really racing forward. There's a, there's a pretty much a gold rush uh, mentality and in industry around uh, creating types of what I believe to be monolingual technologies that uh, insulate nation states from having to deal with multilingual phenomena and, uh, and meanings. Um, so I, the, the future looks deeply challenging. I think that we're, uh, we're in, uh, there, there's still, we still have a kind of a mood, I think, around uh, technology and machine translation that is quite affirmative. Um, but uh, I, d I have not heard a political um, critique of those technologies that has had any, you know, any power. So um, I, th I think the implications of the use of different types of monolingual administrative technologies, for example, in asylum courts and, uh, we, you know, the, the amount of different f formats that are just rolling off, Operation Streamline is just one of them, but asylum uh, interviews that are being done by by closed captioning in the UK Home Office, 
um, there's, there's a spirit of an innovation that is tightening the screws, I think, on multilingual um, claimants and applicants. And um, I, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. And so this is why I wrote the book, The Invention of Multilingualism, which was to say, um, w we need thinkers and philosophers and politicians and activists who are ready to confront the implications of all of this fortified, organized monolingualism in our lives. And at our universities, for example, universities that um, to a certain extent are doubling down on mon monolingualism. Um, you've got administrations that believe that um, a, a fully Anglophone curriculum is, is adequate for global, um, you know, uh, commercial and, and human exchange. Um, and so I think we are really in for um, a difficult couple of decades when it comes to these things. And it's not gonna, just going to stay in the realm of language. It, as we saw with all of these cases, most of these cases have nothing to do with language themselves. They have to do with people's lives and the disposition of, of property and land and all sorts of things that don't usually fall into the remit of applied linguistics, um, for example. So I think we have to get out there and, um, and be uh, and and make new arguments about languages in in the press and in you know our governments that uh, have been drowned out by uh, by mostly kind of corporate supporters of machine translation uh, that those products are being sold to states all around the world and um, I think it's extraordinarily dangerous. Wonderful, um, terrifying talk. I'm sorry. You, oh, wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> because you are calling for um, multilingual activism based on, on the, the importance of our articulating the principles in public. So I'm going to ask you to go a step further. And you are asked to redesign or replace Operation Streamline. And uh, by some miracle, Boris Johnson asks you to come and apply um, these principles, articulate and apply them in asylum courts in the UK. What, what would it look like and how would you explain to people why it's so important? Mm. That's all. Thank you. I mean, uh, thanks for that question. I, 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 think those, I think those questions are what we should be doing in our classes. You've got to replace Operation Streamline and the UK Home Office asylum, uh, what are they called, refugee dis disposition procedures in 24 hours, how are you going to do it, right? I think we should be doing these as group projects and replacing all of our term papers. I hope students in the audience hope like this idea. Replace term papers with uh, new, uh, new institutional infrastructures that are better than the ones that we have. I think that's exactly the kind of thing we need to do immediately. Um, for me, the, the core of what needs to happen is already in the 1951 Convention on Refugees where it is, it is stated very clearly that refugees, for example, are not going to have access to documentation that they would otherwise need for civil and criminal course, uh, uh, cases. And so um, what is usually going to happen is someone is going to come to a... Uh, a decision maker with nothing in their hands except their ability to make meaning in front of that person. And so what that means is that the burden of proof in uh, at the border, um, the US-Mexico border, for example, or uh, wherever the UK uh, Home Office does its work all around the world, it has to think of um, cr the credibility of, of uh, claimants differently and say, uh, and this is why I focus so much on credibility in multilingualism rather than creativity, is to say we have to change the way we frame credibility around multilingual everything, texts, people, evidence, um, uh, processes, and to f figure out ways, and this is, this is something that the, the Refugee Convention specified, is the state has to listen. Um, the the uh, 
Any state that is a signator to the 1951 uh, Convention on Refugees has said, has pledged to listen to claimants adequately enough to figure out if they have a credible fear. That means listening communicatively to that person, which means they need to forego some of the reliance on documents and corroborating evidence that other types of uh, administrative and, and judicial proceedings have. So figuring out how a state can listen is, uh, is I think, and listen multilingually is uh, the next 20 years of jurisprudence. I, um, I, and I hope that Justice Jackson participates in it. Um, I think that the, the uh, European court is doing it. You know, they're, they're modeling some of those things. And if we can figure out how to um, instead of what is happening now, which is the, the kind of replication of monolingual procedures all around the world, the selling of them from state to state, we need to figure out ways for multilingual uh, processes to be replicated and amplified. Um, so I know I, I haven't replaced Operation Streamline in the course of my answer, but uh, I think it has something to do with, with the listening state that was already envisioned in the 1951 convention. I would like to ask a question of my own, if I may. Uh, well, two things. One is you, there's a lot of references to legal uh, documents, legal set, language used in legal settings. Mm. So, I, but I, I'm thinking legalese itself is something perhaps is worth looking into, right? Legalese purposefully, by design, excludes uh, a large re readership. Essentially, most people would have to rely on a particular group of people who we call lawyers to understand what is being said. In fact, you know, how, when we buy a house, when we sign a contract, I mean, when, even when we, we, we have to rely on, even write, write our will, we have to rely on lawyers, right? right? So this is not necessarily a multilingual, monolingual kind of issue, but it's using a particular genre of a language for inclusion or exclusion purposes. So I don't know if you have further comments on that. That's my first part. The second part is I want to also bring, your, uh, uh, bring to your attention this issue of um, uh, academic publication, right? Ac multilingual in, in, in multilingual yeah. settings. What kinds of knowledge counts? You know, what kinds of, in what language do you publish? Uh, the right. kind of, uh, you target talking about truth, this kind of a epistemological um, tension that we experience in a, in a in scholarship that is multilingually constituted. Yep. So these are two issues, if you would like to comment on. I'll try to be brief, Agnes. Um, the, the, when I thought about this talk, actually when I thought about the, the chapter to, of my book that dealt with justice, I knew I had a choice to go kind of pie in the sky, justice as a concept, justice as something that traditions of philosophy have talked about for ages. And I really deliberately wanted to stay in the realm of actual judicial institutions as they are now because I, I didn't know if I could do it, frankly. I didn't know if I could deal with justice institutions as they disappointingly are right now. And so that was the challenge that I chose for, for this particular talk was to say, I would love to talk about decolonial justice and, and gesturing towards indigenous futures and decolonial futures of justice. I, I abstained from doing that because I wanted to see if I could deal with exactly as you say, the, the legal rep uh, register that is a closed system of reference. What, what kind of impelled me to do that was working with an asylum lawyer from the United Kingdom, uh, Sarah Craig, and she and I wrote together a piece about untranslatability. Um, and, uh, you know, untranslatability is one of these concepts that philologists and literary theorists love to talk about. And when I got to, uh, when I got to work with Sarah Craig, she said, um, no, 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 we're not going to talk that way. We're, we're going to talk like lawyers talk. And so I was somehow invited into her register. And for me, that was a kind of multilingual transgression, is figuring out how to, how to um, think a concept like untranslatability in a legal context and what it would look like in practice. And so um, most of the, the 
following aspects of this talk came from that, that experiment, frankly. Um, as far as publishing multilingually, I think that things are still looking pretty abysmal. Um, I did, I wrote, I, I edited, co-edited a journal called Critical Multilingualism Studies, which one would expect would be pretty multilingual, right? I did it for eight years with my colleague Chantal Warner. Um, we had not very much success in cultivating multilingual authorship in that setting. And I was, you know, I was new at this, so I didn't quite know what the reasons for that were. I had colleagues telling me that they would only get credit for their publications if they were written in English. I got people telling me that um, they would be, <clears throat> if they wrote this in their uh, first language or second language, that they would face political consequences. Um, I, I saw colleagues choosing English as a lingua franca for so many different uh, re reasons, none of them having to do with the substance and purpose of the, the, the research itself. Um, and that really bothered me, you know, and I, and I felt like, okay, it's probably time for, for applied linguistics and for other fields like ours to have a discussion about untranslatability and about multilingual epistemologies that would, um, you know, maybe 10, 20 years down the road, allow for a really, really different uh, recognition structure around multilingual knowledge um, that would, uh, that I, I still don't see in, for example, university hiring and promotion schemes, which um, oftentimes look on publications in language other, uh, languages other than English with skepticism at best, um, or non-comprehension. Non and uh, I feel like universities deserve to do better than that. Um, so I'm trying to work towards both multilingual curriculum design, but also multilingual promotion and hiring um, that would, you know, that would live up to what students actually already bring to the university. So, thank you very much. Any further thoughts, comments? Oh. Thank you. I, I enjoyed this talk a lot. I, I originally didn't expect to come, but I'm glad I did. Um, the, the, the topic of multilingualism uh, has me thinking about uh, a lot of things. Uh, I, I do uh, tutoring at the Writing Center here, and um, I have a, I, I've ver very much discovered that there are a lot of ESL students that come in that need help with their writing, but some of them come in with comments from their professors and advice from their professors that kind of it, it, it puts a lot of pressure on them. Like, uh, I had a student yesterday that came in, uh, like, confused why his professor would uh, be so nitpicky about certain things, where the way that he had it conveyed the idea perfectly fine, and mm -hmm. but his professor was very, like, hard on him for it. Oh, you have so many errors here. Um, and then I see all these different assignments that these ESL students will get where they're trying to kind of help them work in this language, um, but they just don't do the job. They're very confusing. They're very, it feels almost like busy work. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, I, I understand that it's, it's going to be a while before we can really work to address these, in full, these problems in full, but what should we do? What should I do to help these students yeah, um, so important. Um, so, gosh, so many thoughts go through my mind. I'll try to keep them brief. First of all, university diversity, inclusion, what's the other one? Equity um, statements and policies don't tend to include language particularly well. So people's multilingualism, people's heritage languages are not recognized as part of the scope of diversity, you know, and, and I think that's a, so the problem starts there, and then you've got a professoriate who, um, uh, professors who oftentimes will not deliberately, but misconstrue a linguistic problem, or an, let's say an, a grammar error, as something that undermines an idea, right, or undermines an argument, and they themselves as professors have been 
punished and taxed for decades for doing that. So uh, they are simply reproducing the, the, well, not simply reproducing, but reproducing the experiences they've had as writers who have gone through a really quite punishing, I think, prescriptivist process to get to academic English. And so they think, usually they think that they're helping. Um, but what they're doing, I think, effectively is discouraging people from becoming makers of, of ideas, um, from becoming participants in kind of complex debates. And they're, they're telling people essentially that it's better to stay silent. And um, I don't think a university should be allowed to, to do things like that in practice or in principle. Um, and so uh, I do think top down, um, or, or bottom up, whichever way, we need a full on reassessment of, of how we engage with multilingual, we engage multilingually with writing at universities. Um, that, that, first of all, to say that a university like Stony Brook University is not an English medium university. I think that's a first step to just ask the president whether it's an English medium university or not and see what they say, you know, because I've taught at an English medium university in Turkey, there, there's a we teach you in English, and you're supposed to, you know, master English. Um, it's a very colonial model. I want all universities in the United States and Canada to, you know, ask themselves whether they think they're English medium universities, and if they affirmatively say no, um, then to to put money behind developing processes and trainings and advocacy and remediation uh, opportunities for students who uh, want to make meaning in all of the languages that they have. You know, um, one of the things that I experienced as a professor in, in Turkey was that a lot of my fantastic, super exciting students uh, stopped doing intellectual work in Turkish after age 18. So, <clears throat> they uh, or they would so they would learn a lots of, they would do a lot of reading in English at university and they would go home to their families and they couldn't really talk about their what they were learning with their families because it was in this this university English and they also were not being encouraged to pursue that range of ideas and concepts and ambitious you know plans in Turkish as well so I think we have a real problem when we um, when, when we exclude uh, heritage languages um, I know that doesn't really help for your work tomorrow um, working with students but I think that a, a be a much broader uh, advocacy program is long long overdue so Thanks for doing that work, too. With that, let's give our speaker a, another round of applause. Thanks, Thank everybody. you so much. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Stay in touch. So stay in touch if you want to chat. Thank you so much, David. This is wonderful. <laughs>